Okay, it is on the hour by my clock. Um, so I think we will get started and I'm going to go ahead and make my screen really big. So welcome everybody to this training on um, coaching. Um, I'm really excited about this one. Um, it's a subject that I'm really interested in. Um, and I think it's really important for um, everyone, all of the managers um, at GitLab to be able to coach their team members. Um, and hopefully by the end of this session, we will have given you some um, useful hints and tips and guidance um, on how you can do that. So our agenda um, is we're going to talk about what coaching is. Um, and I don't mean that in a patronizing way, but I think it's good just to have a very brief out overview of what coaching is all about um, and how you can use it and when you should use it, when you shouldn't use it. And then um, we're going to make it a bit more real and we're uh, going to do a role play with a few scenarios on um, how to coach in a particular situation. Um, and how not to coach and then we'll open it up for discussion and then finally finishing with um, some key takeaways from today. Um, I want to bring up the discussion slide at this point because there is one thing that I want you to um, specifically pay attention to and that is the last role play scenario because we're going to be asking you what was wrong with that so we really do need you to make sure you're paying attention um, then we're going to ask you if you have any stories that you can share of when coaching rather than managing made a positive impact um, and also how you would coach a person who has a fixed mindset and some of you may have come into these situations or have some stories to share um, around that. Now, um, I've had some help uh, with this session and um, Jacob has already, uh, is in, already in on this um, because he joined the call a bit earlier. But I think everybody on the call knows Nadia as the, one of the recruiters, but you may not know that she is actually also an executive coach, a trained executive coach. So it made absolute sense in my mind um, to get her to collaborate with me on this. So, and I think she probably is the best person to talk about what coaching is all about. So Nadia, over to you. Thanks, Abby. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, has any of you received any coaching before? Or maybe either received or given coaching. Jacob, I see you. Uh, let me find more hands. Sid, yes, I'm aware. I don't see a lot of more hands. Um, but my favorite sort of statement about coaching is very much, it's not telling people what to do. So the one that John Flatter, Flattery um, mentioned there, it's coaching is not telling people what to do. It's giving them a chance to examine what they're doing in light of their intentions. There's a few other quotes here that, that I feel is very relevant to, um, to what it is about. Um, and then there's a lot of different types of coaching, but um, for us, this is really focusing nearly on, on team coaching. So as a manager, how you can coach your team here at GitLab and what your responsibility is in terms of a coach in that setting. Uh, some of the different types of coaching is executive coaching. Sid, I think, has mentioned before that he's being coached currently by an executive coach, um, performance coaching, skills coaching, Career coaching, which I've been involved in as well in the past, um, personal and life coaching, very different to the coaching we'll be doing here today, and um, business coaching. It's also a shared responsibility. Um, the coach leads the process while the employee leads the change. Um, so that's something important to just keep in mind. Um, and then why managers should be getting involved with this is it would ultimately improve performance. Which is, which is our goal. And coaching um, is a goal-focused or a solution-focused approach. Um, Abby, am I, yeah, I'm next still. So when we should be coaching, um, these are examples of when, a co when, when we should be coaching, but keep in mind, there's a lot of other times where you can also use coaching instead of training, um, especially in, even in engineering solutions, to lead someone to find a solution 
instead of just giving them the answer. We have a few great examples of that in our teams already, um, but I'm just, I'm just gonna highlight that. So underperformance is something Abby's gonna dig into a little bit more um, during, during the slides. Um, also adapting to change and learning in a new workflow, especially here at GitLab, some individuals do experience onboarding is a bit of a shock. So they might need some coaching in terms of the change that they go through when they, when they join our organization um, and understanding this workflow. And it might not be a training opportunity. It might actually be a great coaching opportunity to let them exp explore, um, explore the change. As well as with career development, as we grow, there's some great opportunities to let your team grow and to grow into the right directions. This nice new change um, that, that Eric has mentioned in terms of the engineering teams and the two different sort of growth opportunities for them. So great career development opportunities there as well, and as well as um, managing relationships and stakeholders. Abby, over to you. Yep. Um, so, whoops, gone a bit too fast. Um, so coaching, I think Nadia and I, and perhaps most of us who've been involved or received coaching um, have think it's a great thing. Um, but there are certain situations where coaching isn't appropriate and it should be avoided. Um, and this slide is from, I should mention, this slide is from Rework with Google um, that I've mentioned in the previous session. And they've listed out some examples there. But I also want to add that if there is an individual who lacks knowledge, skill or ability in a certain area, they need training, um, not coaching. And there is a difference between the two. Um, also, you as a manager, if you are under pressure um, to honor if, if somebody um, isn't performing or whatever, and you feel that you can't give enough of your time to the individual for coaching, then you shouldn't do it. Um, it is a commitment. It does take time um, and your focus and energy as well as the coachee. Um, so it is a very, very much a shared um, process in that respect. Um, also, if the issue perhaps is a lack of resources, um, the team, for example, is too small to handle the massive, massive amount of work, let's say, um, then that is when coaching isn't really going to help um, in that situation. You just need to hire more people, perhaps. Um, and also... As well, if you're a manager, the person might not, might not be getting enough of your direction. Um, so that is a situation where coaching isn't really ideal in that um, scenario. And also, if the coachee themselves isn't bought in to the process um, of coaching, it's an opportunity for them to reflect on their actions um, and attitudes. And if they're not bought into that process, it's just not going to work. And finally, um, even though um, I've read that coaching apparently isn't rocket science, um, if you lack coaching skills as a manager, you may become frustrated and then just revert to start to tell the person what they should be doing. So there are some skills that you do need um, for coaching, which we'll talk about um, a little bit, but I wanted to um, just point out as well, finally, that if there are any legal risks involved to somebody um, or a situation that you might encounter, then coaching um, isn't really the right thing to be doing. Does anybody have any questions um, at this point? And if you could unmute yourself, or I can't actually see you because <laughs> I've got my screen really big. Okay, I'll take that as not yet. Um, so moving on then, we want to talk about how we can coach um, or how you can coach at GitLab. And I think coaching, as Nadia said, you can apply it in all of those different situations like career development and learning a new workflow. Um, but we wanted to particularly focus on underperformance um, because in our process, in the handbook on the underperformance process, we do encourage managers to do coaching um, as well before going to the more formal PIP process. 
Um, so we thought this would be a good one to kind of take a bit more of a deeper dive um, into. And I've actually, um, I did a bit of reading around this and I found um, quite a good article, which I've linked um, in the notes on this slide. And I'd like to talk a bit about that. So um, the first thing um, that it recommends is to actually um, explain um, why something needs to be changed to the individual. And this is about, you know, laying out the situation, um, talking about how whatever it is, is affecting the rest of the team, how it affects the company, um, and how a change um, needs to happen. The ultimate goal um, with this is to try to find the root cause of the situation, because trying to solve symptoms um, of this just isn't going to work, and it might happen again because you've not managed to get to the root cause um, of the problem. Um, so after you've explained it, you've laid out the situation, you've laid out, laid out what the issue is, then you can ask the individual to confirm that they understand um, that it's important, that a change needs to happen, and it's also um, their responsibility um, to make the change and to come up with um, potential solutions to solve the problem. And that's when you move to the third stage, which is to involve. So the two of you can collaborate and come up with some ideas um, on how um, you can potentially come to a solution, investigating the root cause, and then look at setting goals. And those could be um, smart objectives um, or smart goals. Um, so they're specific, measurable, um, attainable, um, realistic, um, and time bounded. And once that happens, after a while, you'll begin to acknowledge and appreciate um, and recognize the positive movement towards achieving the goal. And this is all part of these coaching sessions um, that you would have with the individual. Um, but the purpose of it is to make sure that you are asking, as the manager, asking the right sorts of questions. So usually starting with how, what, where, and why. Um, also, probably the biggest element of this is to listen. Um, and that sounds obvious, but it's actually quite difficult to do, particularly as a manager, you may have more experience, you may have more knowledge, and you may be able to tell the person or be tempted to tell the person what they need to do and the steps they need to do to fix whatever it is um, that needs to be fixed. So that all sounds very easy, doesn't it? And I think um, what we would like to do, myself and Nadia, is to kind of make this a bit more real. I say real because this is, <laughs> this is a role play, so that kind of sounds a bit strange to say that, but we've come up with a, a few scenarios, and I'll click on my tab and go to the top, um, to try um, and demonstrate what we've just talked about um, in the last slide. And I should say that these are not based on real situations. Um, Nadia and I are kind of playing ourselves. Um, we changed the names. Um, I think Nadia wanted to change the names, but uh, anyway, they're not based on real situations, but they're kind of good examples of how to coach and the kind of things, the questions that you need to be asking and, and that kind of thing. So the first scenario is um, to hire for director of back-end engineering and I'm playing the role of a recruiter and Nadia is my manager and in this scenario I'm trying to hire for this role and I do have the the skills and the knowledge to get this done but for some reason I'm just not having any success and Nadia has spotted this she's disappointed um, in my performance so far and she's thinking about putting me on a pip if it continues, but she wants to try to informally coach me into thinking of new ways um, to approach and achieve the goal. Okay, so Nadia, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Um, Abby, how is the search going for the Director of Backend Engineering? Oh, it's not great. I'm just really not seeing um, 
any results um, from all the other methods that we've tried. The pipeline is very low, just not seeing the CVs um, that, you know, that we need to have coming through. Um, what do you think, what do you think we can do differently at this stage for this particular position? Um, I think more, more direct sourcing of passive candidates perhaps and more looking into companies with similar profiles to GitLab. Um, what, what sort of additional platforms do you think we can, we can use? Um, I know we've had some success with Stack Overflow in the past. So that would probably okay, be that one, one thing. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting solution. How would you go about adding an additional, um, an additional supplier to our sourcing plat platform? Uh, yeah, I guess I need to, we definitely, yeah, I definitely need to reach out to, to get a contact initially because I know we don't have one. Um, so yeah, that would, yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds really good. Are there additional ways that the team or maybe I can support you through this time? Uh, yeah, do you know what? I, I think part of this is because I don't have the time. I've been so focused on screening calls. Um, and that's been, that's where I've been spending the majority of my time. So if I could pass some of them off to Sabrina, that would be really great. Most well, certainly. How much, how much time do you think you're going to need, Abby? Um, I think probably about 10 hours so that I can do that and then also have time to research into other sources like um, meetups and, and things like that and tap into those um, communities. Okay, this sounds really, really good. I'm excited to see how it works out. I've kept some notes on a doc that I'll share with you. Um, and then I'd like to check in. How does, how does checking in in about two weeks sound? Yeah, okay. Is this outside of our one-on-one? -on -one? Um, I'd like to keep this as a, as a coaching opportunity through this particular, particular situation. So we can, I'd, I'd prefer if we do it outside of our one-on-one one -on -one and not make it task specific. Okay, great. Sounds good. Great. Thanks, Abby. Okay, so that was the first scenario. And um, I hope that we were able to convey what we were trying to do there was to demonstrate what the goal was, as in I'm trying to hire for this position. Um, Nadia was asking me a lot of questions. And Nadia is a very experienced recruiter who would know exactly what to do, where to go. And she didn't give me didn't give that information to me so she was really making me um think about what i needed to do and putting the yeah. onus of the goal onto me um, and, and and abby yeah. highlighting here that most of the questions are open-ended so the goal is not to have yes or no answers that's actually why we ask a lot of these how where what why questions um so that they can't answer yes or no you want them to explore their own ideas in this particular scenario yeah, and finally, I was also um, committing to action on my part, that I was the one who was, and I, you know, gave the, you know, that I said that I needed time and that I was going to be, um, you know, making sure that I was um, committing to this, as well as Nadia as well. Okay, so moving on um, to the second scenario, and again, this isn't based on a real situation, um, but something we were thinking about when we were coming up with an example is the fact that as we work remotely, um, it could be quite easy for a team member within a team to perhaps feel disconnected, and there could be a variety um, of reasons why that's the case. Um, and in this one, the, um, the scenario is that I am a member of Nadia's team. Nadia has other members in her team. We have weekly team meetings and opportunities for um, discussion and ideas. I have some really great ideas that I'm able to articulate and communicate very well to Nadia in our one-on-ones. But when it comes to the team call, our team call, 
I'm not able um, or I don't feel that I'm able to fully um, communicate those despite the fact there are two other members of the team who are working on exactly the same thing as me. And Nadia has noticed that there is, it's starting to affect my performance and my productivity is starting to slip. Okay, so here goes. Um, Ali, how's the interaction been with Sabrina and Tristan lately? Oh, it's, yeah, it's been fine. Okay, I've noticed during our team meetings that you didn't jump in to the conversation of what you've been working on with Sabrina and Tristan. And during our one-on-one -on -one, um, discussion, you've been sharing some really good ideas with me. I was just, I didn't see them come through as, why is that? Oh, well, you know, they're so passionate um, and they have so much to contribute. As you, as you see, when we have our team call, they're straight in and they've got so much to say. And um, I, I just don't want to, I don't feel that I'm able to kind of jump in and, and say anything. And also in a group setting and on a video call, it's hard to speak and know when to speak without feeling like, I, I'm interrupting and I think that would be a bit rude. Did you, did you notice our handbook was recently updated by our CEO regarding interruptions specifically? Uh, yeah, I did notice that. Yeah. What, what did you think of that update? I've read it um, and I understand, you know, the, the idea but behind it. And I think that's really great, but I just don't, and it just feels strange um and i think i'll work i need to work on my confidence um to feel that i'd be able to interrupt if somebody's talking too much okay abby um what other ways do you think you can contribute to this discussion then um well what i'm what i've noticed is that i'm in a group discussion um once it's over, then I realize afterwards, oh, actually, I should have said this or I should have said that. And I could make more of an effort to follow up, um, perhaps in Slack or create an issue and carry on with the discussion there. If I feel that I haven't made my points or been able to say um, very much. OK, I'd really like to support you through this. Um, what, what do you think the team and I can do to, to make this easier and to support you right now? Um, I think they could involve me a bit more um, and actually ask me for my thoughts on the call because it's very, you know, you'll ask a question or say something, we need to do this or, you know, whatever. And then they'll jump in and say, yeah, and this is what we need to do. And this is how we need to do it. And there's kind of no pause for them to say, oh yeah, and Abby, what do you think? Um, so I think that would help if um, they could make a conscious effort to ask me. And I know that's difficult because we have a time restriction. Um, and they could also like ping me in, in chat or something or just, you know, ask me to jump in i really i really like that idea i actually think this could be great feedback um for them and i would encourage you to share it with them um and i'll make sure that when we have the people ops calls i'll leave i'll leave enough time to to have a discussion and to leave time and space to ask questions and to jump in um when you when you feel you're ready okay great thanks Okay, last example, which is the bad coaching example. Um, and this is, so Abby, I'm going to jump in here because this is really what happens in, I think, any form of remote environment. I think in GitLab, we've been fairly good in one-on-one -on -one sessions to concentrate on the call, especially if it's an important call. Um, but when things get really busy, it's easy to get distracted. Um, so that's something to look out for here. So Abby, okay, you take over the scenario. Yeah, so in this scenario, the same one um, as the first one that we talked about, the hiring of the director of backend engineering. Um, so exactly the same, same type of issue and the same type of questions. Hey, Abby, how's it going with that, um, that back, what is it, uh, director of backend engineering role? Oh, it's, it's not going well. I haven't made any progress. Sorry, just 
Can you give me one sec and someone's slacking me? I just want to respond to this. Just give me one sec. Okay, oh, so you haven't made progress. Um, have you searched on Hack and Use and Stack Overflow? And I think you've mentioned a few other sites in the past. No. Um, um, don't you think that could work? Um, it could, but didn't we try that before? Um, that's a that's a really good point. Um, perhaps you should maybe you should reach out to Stack Overflow again and just see where where that goes and if um, you have more success this time. Okay, I'll do that. Um, are there any other places I should be searching for this? You know what? Um, let me go and do some research on it, and then I'll send you a few other platforms that you can that you can search on. How does that sound? Oh, great. Thanks. So I will okay. carry on then with um, my screening calls and sourcing for the developer roles. Okay, that sounds really good. Um, right. So can we check in again on this in our next one on one? How does sounds good? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Abby. Okay, so I will go back to the slides. So um, I think I can, yeah. Um, so perhaps I'll ask the question to everybody, what was wrong with that last scenario? Um, I feel like in the last scenario, both of you were very professional when you were interacting with each other, so that was good. However, it seems like Abby wasn't really being empowered to do the work and take action. So that's how it came across to me. I also, um, going off of what Kathy was saying, um, Nadia was giving a lot of the suggestions rather than letting Abby take ownership on it. Uh, so in what was going on, Abby was just going to continue on what she was doing the way she was doing it rather than learning any new solutions while Nadia was going to be giving her what needed to be done. And uh, Nadia didn't really give a full call to action or anything there because she was busy on Slack. Yeah, she uh, is busy engaged. <laughs> <it's> just... <laughs> yeah. Oh, <screen>. <laughs> <laughs> At least I played it out. No, you did a great job. Yes, um, that's very true. I think um, the, the main points we wanted you all to pick up on, which is great, um, is the fact that I, um, I had that taken away from me. It didn't become, it wasn't my issue anymore. Nadia was quick, very quick to sort of take it off of me and try and just make a quick fix. And I wouldn't, I'm not going to be learning anything. So if it happens again in the future, I'm just going to go straight to Nadia with a problem and say, Nadia, here's my problem. You fix it for me and tell me what I need to do. Um, and also Nadia was not listening at all. Um, she was getting pinged on Slack. She was away. Her mind was elsewhere, um, which is just, if you're going to have a coaching session, you really, really need to be sure that you are giving your hundred percent focus um, to the coachee. So that means turning off Slack, trying to look at the screen. I know it's difficult because we all have screens, but you know, trying to convey that you are fully engaged um, and in there with them. Okay, um, so I would like to ask all of you um, what stories you have of when coaching rather than managing made a positive impact. There was a time really early on uh, when I first became a manager at GitLab um, when someone was like not doing too well. And I think about this instance a lot and just kind of like chit chatting with them and trying to give them the opportunity to tell me because they were really good. They are a really good uh, programmer and they were really solid and they always did really good. And then suddenly things just dropped off and then just letting them talk, we kind of discovered that the, organization of the things that they were working on. They just had too many things on their plate and they were trying to be a hero and finish them all at once. 
Um, but I don't think that they would have, like if I would have just been like work harder and, you know, come on, get, get your crap done. I think they would have, they probably would have just tried to get the stuff done. Um, and instead we discovered that I was like, they just had too many things on their plate, which wouldn't have happened if I didn't give them a chance to just kind of explore what was going on. Does that count as a coaching situation? Yeah, I think it does, Jacob. I think um, you explored root cause and I'd like to know how you coach them through it. So what sort of, so what did you do to, to um, let them figure out how to make that pressure less and how to ensure that they're working? I don't, I don't want to use the word better, but they, they better prioritize and reach those goals um, or their intentions a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing in that case was just that, you know, every, every person has a different bandwidth and you're always trying to figure out what that bandwidth is and to get people to like open up that communication of like, Hey, you've got, you've given me too many things um, versus saying like, I'm just going to get it all done uh, no matter what. And so, like, sometimes it's really hard to figure out that you've given somebody too many things to work on because no. they'll just like you can mix up the underperforming with the giving them too many things um, pretty easily. So in terms of uh, giving too many things to do, um, is that something that could maybe be addressed by setting goals from the beginning and then kind of measuring those smart goals against what they're working on week to week? For, for me, coaching is less about traditional performance management and more about um, focusing in on some key areas that will help someone's effectiveness and perception and abilities. And, uh, and like the team said earlier, a little less task focused. And so I think that, um, if you can, if you can break away from the just the in moment stuff and think more holistically about the person and how they can be more effective, then I think that can make coaching super helpful. I think the managing side is more of the here's your goal, here's what you need to achieve, here's how to achieve it. The coaching to me is more coaching around the how and the behaviors and things that will sustain across multiple projects, not just one. Sorry about that. I was just having, I was just sneezing. Um, apologies. Um, so has anybody had any experience of coaching and how they would coach somebody who has a fixed mindset about the subjects that you, that you wish to coach them on? I think for me, that's a very, very challenging type of person to coach because um, for me, the biggest challenge is figuring out, okay, so they've got a fixed mindset and they don't necessarily want to um, necessarily dissent and then commit as a team. They already have their ideas of exactly how they want to do this. So um, as a manager, when I encounter someone like that, that is one of the most challenging scenarios for me. And have I had a lot of success working with someone like that? I'm not sure. It's kind of um, hit or miss sometimes. Some people are willing to be more open and you can talk to them and say, hey, look, I, I completely understand why you would want to do things this way. Um, but we have to work as a team and this is the approach that seems like it's, it's best for the company or for everybody. Um, and then some people are more open-minded and say, okay, yeah, I, I don't totally agree with this approach, but I can get on board and uh, drive things this way. But other people, it's just, it never really happens. So any tips that you guys could give me on how to flip this so that it works out better would be appreciated. 
I think there's some people that just have a hard time getting there. But I think that tips for me would be really to help explain the why um, with the with the person that you're trying to to coach. And for some, that takes longer than others. And for some people, they want to see the data and, and really understand why are we going here. And the most you can do is just try to present what you have. But if you can get feedback and elements from more than one source, for example, if you were coaching me that um, I'm too aggressive in trying to get projects accomplished and it might mean that the first project goes great, but then no one ever wants to work with me again because I, I just pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and didn't take um, other people's considerations into account when I was driving what my initiative was and what, what I wanted. Um, if I've never heard that from anybody and if I think the project was super successful and if everyone gave me a big like thumbs up Barbie great job and then you came in to coach me on doing it differently that would be very confusing for me so one thing that helps you be a better coach is everybody else around also being honest and transparent about what they're experiencing and then that can help each of us to understand better the areas that we need to focus on that when we do hear it from our manager and also coaching doesn't need to be from your manager. It can be from anyone at the company that wants to invest in you. Um, that when we hear from that person, we're a little bit less, okay, this is more about you than me. And we understand actually it is about me. It's an investment in me and it's someone giving me the time that I need for me to be better. And it doesn't actually help them. They're investing in me and I should appreciate that. Uh, so I think that really explaining the why, really explaining your investment in them, and really explaining what you hope that they will get out of it and maybe suspend dis disbelief for just a moment and say, wow, why don't we, if we try doing this differently for a while, let's see what the impact is. Uh, and really try to, to get them along with you and understand that you're their partner in this. Um, you're not their, um, it, this is less of a boss relationship in many cases and more of a investment relationship and if you can get there it can help but there are some people who will never get there and then that's a whole other discussion and other a training for another day <laughs> but uh but i think that the most that you can do to show that you're giving um and you really want them to accept what you're giving i think it can be helpful adding to what barbie said also um in my prior experiences trying to handle situations with um, people that do have that fixed mindset, it's also really important um, to go back to listening to them. Uh, don't let them take over the conversation and let them, you know, completely grill you. But at the same time, be able to understand where that mindset is coming from and what you can do to help them, you know, get over it and try to change that and help them out along the way. What I found is that frequently when people have a fixed mindset, um, they are fixed about things that I didn't tell them that were flexible. So I never told them that the, the number of people on the team, the budget, uh, the external uh, help they could acquire, uh, the disruption to the rest of the company, the money they could spend. I never told them that those things weren't fixed, that it was about achieving those goals. And if those things, I, because I, I, I get to allocate those things. I tend to think of those things as flexible and in service of the goals. Um, but for them, the experience is different. They have to go to a poll to ask for the budget and they know there's a limited set of people, et cetera. So many times it's me forgetting to tell people that it isn't fixed and, and this is in the, uh, that, that these are options. Can, so, I don't know if I'm the only one, I could be the only one, but I'm a little bit confused as to what coaching is specific. Like, I, of course I know the word coaching, but what we're trying to get at what coaching is versus training versus managing, like all these things seem very closely related. And I don't feel like we clearly, do. like, I guess that coaching is opening up the opportunity for the person to discover themselves uh, but is this only in a problem situation? Is this like in other situations? Like, I don't totally understand the specifics of like what we're going for here. Maybe I'm the only one. Um, so in terms of, we picked underperformance because we kind of thought that was a, it's a difficult one um, as well. So we may as well tackle it um, or try to tackle it head on. 
Um, but you can use coaching in other situations as well. Um, so I think we mentioned um, learning a new workflow, for example, um, or managing relationships and, you know, stakeholders and, and that kind of thing. I think the difference between managing and coaching, when you're managing um, a situation, um, you, you as a manager are basically saying, here's what you need to do. Here's when you need to get it done by and laying out the steps. But with coaching, you are kind of asking a lot of open questions and trying to figure out and get the person to get there um, and try and come up with their own solutions. You may have the answer and it may, it's difficult because your, your instant reaction might be, well, this is what you need to do. You just need to do it this way. Go off and do it and tell me when you've done it. Um, but this is, coaching is more about getting them to get there. I see. And so... Uh, so it is the open-ended questioning and allowing the person to discover the solution themselves. Is it, cause I know in the beginning you had said that, um, so what, I mean, what other than performance would you use it for? Do you know what I mean? Sorry, could you repeat that? I missed, I missed that. Oh, okay. Um, so in terms of, you have, a, in your example, you gave it as an example of like a pre-PIP situation. Uh, other than that, um, can you give me an example of like something else you might use it for? Um, so I think, perhaps trying to not let's, let, let's take it out. Let's move away from underperformance and perhaps more about if somebody comes to you with a particular situation or a difficulty, it might not be affecting their performance, but they just want to, and you have the, you've been through it before, you know how to do it and everything else, but they're coming to you and saying, I have this thing that I'm trying to do. I'm not having a lot of luck. Um, and then you can sort of, then begin to ask those open questions. Well, have you thought about this? Um, or why is this happening? And, you know, try to analyze it and go through those steps with them um, to get there. And if somebody else wants to jump in and correct me or add a bit more meat to this, um, that would be really great in case I'm saying totally the wrong thing. because I'm by no means a subject matter expert. Jacob, also, if, you, if you're developing someone in your team, um, so from a career development perspective, it's a really great tool. Um, so instead of telling them what to do and um, sort of leading the way of what they should be doing next in their career in order to get somewhere, you can really coach them in making those decisions themselves and figuring out if that's the right route they want to, want to be going. Yeah. Um... As Nadia said, I think it really helps guide somebody if they are achieving bigger goals, if they want to move on to those leadership roles, you can help coach them through it. Um, in addition to that, I've also found in my previous roles that um, when major changes are happening, that a lot of times it does take some coaching with um, who's, who you're working with to help them guide along that, even though they might not have any negative mindset yet, or they might not have any positive mindset yet. Uh, they just don't know what to expect and that they want that guidance along them to help them. Can add a story here if you'd like. Yes. Yes. Cliche. So at a different company, um, at a situation where we had a, a really one of the top performers actually, um, and we had an all local team and he moved away and he was the first experiment in remote work uh, for me, for, the, for this team at least. And, um, and after a month or so, we started to see a change, um, a negative change, um, not so much in his performance and results, but just sort of like hostility and sensing anger and people taking his comments at least as anger. Um, and, uh, and it was starting to throw off the team a little bit. So I had it. So I started to obviously formulate. I was disappointed myself because, you know, it was at his request and I was at the time not remote friendly. I've obviously flipped the bit on that one. But um, 
uh, you know, it was his request and we were making, we're going out of our way to accommodate it and it wasn't working out. And so I was frustrated and I had made a bunch of conclusions in my head about what was going wrong. And I went to talk with him, but I basically suspended all of my, uh, my commentary and my emotion around it and just started asking a bunch of questions. And after a, a long dialogue, I don't have to go through the dialogue, but it turned out that, um, we had a couple of breakthroughs. There were some things going on, both in his personal life, but also in his manner of communication and other things. The point though is that we came up with completely different things than I would have gone into if I just told him what to do. I was wrong. He had different things going on that I was unaware of. Um, but then also, one of the key things about this was afterwards, he was incredibly grateful to me for coaching him through it because I helped him see some things that he didn't realize were going on. Um, and he was completely unaware. We were both unaware of effectively. Um, but together we came up with a better, you know, understanding and set of solutions. And, uh, and just that sort of coaching dialogue, as opposed to me just telling him, meant that he opened up. We came up with our solutions, but also then really made him appreciate the situation and me as a manager and all this kind of stuff. And he then went, you know, and then everything was resolved and he went back to being one of the top performers again. So I don't know, can I be heard now? Yes. Okay, I had to switch to my phone, sorry. <laughs> the computer mic wasn't picking up. I think that um, I, I, I might have missed some of what was being said while I was trying to restart this, but the coaching and, and performance management piece can be confusing because they're not completely mutually exclusive. You can use coaching behaviors as part of performance management, but coaching can be used far beyond that as well. So if you think about a professional musician or a professional sports player, just because they're at the top of their game doesn't mean that they can't still use coaching. If you're an amazing violinist, it doesn't mean that someone there to coach, inspire, and motivate you uh, will ever be a bad thing. And so I definitely wouldn't want people to focus as in only on performance management. I think that uh, each of us has areas that we can continue to grow in and that they could be a strength that getting stronger will have great impact or they could be a weakness that getting stronger will have great impact. But uh, I wouldn't focus on, I definitely wouldn't focus on just being about performance management. Okay, I see we only have about three minutes left. Um, and I just wanted to kind of reiterate a few um, key things for you all to go away with. Um, and I think we've already talked about a lot of this, but we said coaching is not about telling people what to do. Um, it's an iterative process, which is great um, for GitLab and the way that we work, um, because as we all know, iteration is one of our values. Um, and it does require a growth mindset. And you should ask open questions. Um, listening is very, very, very important. And make sure that you're focusing um, your attention on coaching and try uh, to identify the root cause. Um, and that is everything that we wanted to talk about. Um, and I just wanna also say that we do not expect this to be it um, in terms of coaching. It's a very broad subject. Um, you know, it's, it's not something we can just do in 50 minutes and expect everybody to know how to do it and go off and do it. Um, we, we appreciate that and we will be sure to follow up on this and all of the other topics that we've talked about um, as well. But we have about two minutes left. So is there, does anybody have any questions? Thanks for doing this, I really appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you, um, everybody, for joining this call. I, I, thought, it, I thought it was great. Um, and thank you, Nadia, for your help. And um, thanks, everybody, for contributing and being here. Um, yeah, and I will see you all again um, when we do our next session. Thanks very much, and have a good rest of the day. Cheers, everyone. Bye.